welcome in to the Lions 24-7 podcast. It is our 12th post-game edition of this fall, and it's the final one of the regular season. We'll come at you with a bowl matchup post-game in about six weeks or so from now, but we got a lot to discuss. And, and Daniel, when you and I, by the way, Daniel Gallon's joining us from, from Detroit, uh, not from Ford Field. He was locked out uh, of a podcast situation over there, so made it back to his team hotel. It's about 1.20 a.m., so we appreciate Daniel for for sticking around with us this late and, and hopping on for another podcast. You're fresh out of there. The party was on in Detroit, man. I mean, we, we talked about the different paths that this matchup could take. Where would Penn State's motivation be? What would their offense look like? What would Drew Aller's availability look like? How would he look if he played? Would the running backs do, be able to duplicate some success from last week? And we got all that and more. And a 42 to nothing victory for the Nittany Lions that sends them to 10 and 2. We think they'll be sent to a New Year's Six Bowl coming out of this matchup. And man, when we talked about what did kind of taste did you want to leave internally, externally in the mouths of the Penn State community exiting the Big Ten play and, and preparing for bowl prep, this was best case scenario playing out on Black Friday. Yeah, Penn State just thoroughly dominated Michigan State. And I think that, you know, on the defensive side of the ball, we saw kind of what we've been seeing all season long in terms of Adisa Isaac making plays, Job Robinson affecting things. Uh, we we had a pretty good Abdul Carter game today, I thought. He got into the backfield for a sack. You had the secondary making some big pass breakups. They, they did their job. They did, I think, what we had come to expect and what we saw for most of the season outside of that Indiana game. But then the offense really came through. It was touch and go a little bit. Uh, in the early going, they have to settle for field goals on their first three drives. They get six points out of it. They go into halftime up 13 to nothing, but it really does feel like much, much more than that. It should have probably been in the you know, 24 nothing range, something like that, but it's 13 to nothing. And you don't feel like Michigan State is going to be able to do anything because of how that defense is playing. And the offense finally kicked it into gear. Um, so I, I thought it was just a very, you know, you were kind of wondering how they would come out. Um, they did a good job of rebounding from the Michigan loss against Rutgers, even though that wasn't the smoothest day, but it's Black Friday. So kind of a, a bit of a sterile environment at Ford Field. You're not on campus. It's Thanksgiving. There's, there's all these different things. And they came out and they just dominated. So I came away from this. I feel like it was a really good exclamation point on the season 10 and two in position for another new year six bowl. I think that in terms of maybe the, uh, like the, it's obviously not best case scenario, but I think that all told this is kind of a, this is a good result, um, you know, for this program and, and for this team. Yeah. It pushes them. I believe the number now 21 and zero against big 10 teams that are not wearing the Michigan or Ohio state uniform since the start of, of I'm sorry, not just big 10 teams against all teams, 21 and zero uh, overall. Uh, of course that 0 and four mark against Michigan and Ohio state during that span is, is a blemish. Uh, but as James Franklin talked about in post game, uh, it sounded like he was very appreciative to get to these 10 wins. Um, he, he talked about the rarity of doing it in back-to-back -back years. We discussed that a bit earlier on the pregame podcast. It's the third time now that Penn State has sacked, stacked consecutive double-digit win totals uh, in, in seasons. Uh, third time they've done that since the 1994 undefeated campaign. They did it in 2008, 2009, and they did it in 2016, 2017, and now here, 2022, 2023. I don't know where you want to start. I mean, I, I think the defense deserves some 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 love at the top of this show. Sometimes we, we bury them a little bit because we, we work our way through all the offensive storylines, and there are a bunch of those today, but – uh, you gave me a text uh, before we recorded. Initially, it looked like Penn State limited Michigan State to 68 yards. Upon further review, uh, an adjustment may bring that all the way down to 53 total yards for the Michigan State Spartans on Black Friday. That is a program low, and they've been playing football for a long time in East Lansing. Uh, the stats tonight, which, by the way, the third shutout on the season for the Nittany Lions in 2023, they blanked UMass in October. They shut out Iowa, the, the Big Ten West champion Iowa Hawkeyes back in September. Seven sacks, 12 tackles for loss, eight forced three and outs that just kept this offense on the attack all night, it felt like. So Manny Diaz, take a bow and prepare to get paid. I know. I, I think that when you look at this, there's, there's a big picture conversation that we can have maybe next week in terms of looking back on the season and the opportunity that you had with this type of defense 
and how things turned out. But I think that for right now, I mean, you just need to appreciate what you saw from that. Um, I think that uh, over the course of the season, this is definitely one of the most fun defenses I've ever watched at any level. I thought that the creativity of Manny Diaz was really on display uh, in, in terms of where guys, you know, we saw Cam Miller have another sack today, like just bringing pressure from everywhere, um, never letting up. I saw some tweets going around about Manny Diaz blitzing seven up 42 to nothing uh, against the, a walk on backup quarterback and uh, Penn State plays to the whistle. I think that that's something that when we talk about the offense that we can highlight, but I just thought that this was just a very complete defensive performance. It was kind of similar to the Rutgers game where even when the offense wasn't quite in gear early on, you really had really had no worries. I know that Michigan State got it, they got theirs a couple times in the first half, but you look at those second half stats being hold the negative yardage uh, over the course of of the last thirty minutes. Like it was, they had Michigan State just in in a bind, and there was the Spartans. They just could not get out of it. So I think that. You know, this defense next year is going to look a lot different. You talk about guys who had big nights tonight. I mean, Adisa Isaac, uh, I think, is in that day two conversation for the NFL draft now. Uh, you know, Curtis Jacobs showed up again on a big stage with one and a half sacks. This could be his final regular season game at Penn State. Uh, Kalen King uh, is another one of those guys. Um, so I just thought it was just such a thorough performance, um, especially on a season where there aren't really big stack guys on that defense. I think that, and Mark and I were talking about it during the game, that we think that Adisa Isaac is probably the only member of this defense who's a lock for um, maybe first team all Big Ten or something along those lines. I think there's guys that are going to get recognized because of name recognition. I think someone like Abdul Carter for sure. But um, in terms of having those counting stats, not a lot of guys have them. But tonight you saw kind of what the sum of all those parts is. I'll tell you what was maybe the most impressive individual play in this series of many great plays for the defense on, on Friday night, Daniel, was uh, when Adiza Isaac and Chop Robinson raced to the running back and almost you know, they almost took the handoff. Either one of those guys could maybe had a chance to take the handoff. They bury him in the backfield, and you're just reminded – when Chop Robinson's available and when Adiza Isaac is opposite of him, you know, factor in the guy denied Dennis Sutton either on the sideline or, or out there with him. And he's he's a five star for a reason as well. But Chop Robinson and, and, and Adiza Isaac, what they have brought off the edge as, as speed rushers against the run, against the pass, it is just an undeniably dominant aspect of this Penn State defense. You bring up a good point in mentioning so many names and, and, and how the stats have been spread throughout. Uh, I think Abdul Carter, though, is starting to get his, starting to collect those stats. He had two sacks today. It was an abbreviated day for him. Uh, he did exit early with, with an apparent injury. Didn't seem to be getting a lot of medical attention uh, during that second half. He was more of an, a game observer. And you noted that after this matchup, he was available for post-game media uh, for some time, although it was a little bit hectic in there. I don't think you were able to get to him. But I think that's always a good indication whenever we see a guy on the sideline during the game He's not going to show up and talk to the media if Penn State is really worried about his medical situation. And we've got a while to go until this team plays his 13th game. So maybe some concern about Abdul Carter exiting this one and not seeing him get back. But I think some of the things, if you can look through the details here of what happened in the second half and after the matchup, it bodes well for Abdul Carter's availability moving forward. And it's big because it's a 2022 freshman All-American who really didn't look like that for maybe two thirds of this season. He's been a different player in November, and on that same subject, how about his fellow 2022 freshman All-American? In fact, the Big Ten's freshman of the year last year, Nick Singleton. And I know James Franklin said it last week. He said it in post game that he said, you know, if you work your way through the film and you're a true football guy, you're going to see a, an improved overall running back in Nick Singleton versus the player who took the field in 2022. But the explosive plays were back in, in, in that uh, in that toolbox today. And they have not been for a long time, Daniel. He had big plays as a runner, big plays as a receiver. We'll talk about what those guys did collectively in him and Katron Allen. But this was the performance that we've all been waiting for throughout the season from Nick Singleton. 180 rushing yards on 18 carries. That's a 6.6 .6 average. That sounds familiar. That's right around where his average was last season as a freshman and got it done as a receiver. Two catches for 68 yards. He had a 53-yard catch. He had a 15-yard catch. That's been a definitely a better part of his repertoire here as a sophomore, as a receiver, as a blocker. And now on a night when he was flashing all as a runner, 
this is one of those things we said you get to spend the next four weeks or so building yourself up about a duplicate performance rather than fretting about not finding it all season long. I, I think that you saw on the 53-yard the catch and run, it was something that we've talked about at times this year where just get him the ball in space and, and make something happen. Tyler Warren had a really, really nice block to spring him on that. Uh, he made a couple guys miss, ran through some guys. Um, I, I just think that it was the um, – I just think it was just like a really, really like, solid thing to see from Nick Singleton – um, I know that now. Okay. Sorry. I was thinking I was getting a Catron Allen <laughs> uh, con confused with Singleton for a moment, but hey, they, they, they both brought it tonight. Yeah. I mean, they it were was, it was a special night. And it, honestly, we'll talk about the numbers, but this was as good as they have looked together. And now it has been what 25 games uh, on the same college campus sharing this backfield. And we should know Catron Allen got to start in Detroit. We all, I, I was saying it's Nick Singleton tonight. It's Nick Singleton's turn in the rotation. J1 Slater, Ty Howell, whoever got that decision done determined that Catron Allen was going to be the guy who got the ball first. And in fact, he had eight touches before Nick Singleton surfaced and then joined the party. And of course, he took it and ran with it as well. Yeah, well, I think Nick Singleton's first snap was a, a third and seven run that got stopped for two yards. And you're kind of like, oh, no, here we go again. <laughs> but once Nick Singleton got going, I, I think you saw the the vintage stuff from last year. I think that there's people that know football a little bit better than me that can point out some of the scheme things that Penn State was doing, but it just seemed like that they made things easier for him. We've heard so much about things being simple because that means you can play fast and you want someone like Nick Singleton playing fast because that's when he's at his best. Um, but I thought it was cool at the end of the game uh, where Penn State made sure that they got him his 100 yards. Uh, I think he had a 24-yard run with less than a minute left um, that I kind of thought he was going to break the rest of the way. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think that people can kind of say what they want about having your starters in that late in the game, um, et cetera. But I think that the one thing that James Franklin has shown is that he's going to keep the pedal down. And when you have backups in there, this is really the only opportunity that some of them get. So he wants them to be playing, you know, and get their chance to you know do it because, Part of its preparation where when you're called up and you're a backup and you're in live you know the run of you know the game flow you know you're going to be doing different things you're, it's a different intensity level so you need to be ready but i thought that getting nick singleton over 100 yards which is kind of a, a, a nice cherry on top um you know ending the season right because it's definitely the season that i don't think any of us expected for nick singleton i, I like i do believe you know, some of the stuff that James Franklin says about how he's improving. I mean, we definitely saw uh, his improvement as a pass catcher. We heard good things about his blocking um, from people beyond James Franklin. But I think, but you're a running back. And so your job is to tote the rock, make things happen. And for whatever reason, that just wasn't really happening that much this season. So I think it was really cool for Nick Singleton to have this type of night on this stage and, and really close the year strong. Um, you mentioned some of the schematic adjustments. We we have some wonderful posters at lines247.com. We have a tremendous we have posters all over there and, and we love them all for different reasons, but there are some that really yeah, you know, they can bring some scheme analysis in and, and some pretty quick stuff while you're collecting quotes and and we're trying to get up the James Franklin press conference and all the stuff that we're trying to do post game. Uh, our guy Jem Rich over at Lines 24-7, he went through it a little bit. He's and by his count, just a couple plays where you actually had Lyman pulling involved in the rush attack. And what does that tell you along with, with some of those pistol formations? They wanted to get Nick Nick Singleton and Katron Allen moving forward without much to think about. And, and I think, you know, we've, we've heard it from James Franklin about having trying to take a lot off the table from the receivers and focus in on what they excel at and then build upon that and build confidence off that rather than trying to make them professionals at every single aspect of what your offense requires. And by the way, there were a few times that James Franklin said, here in the last two weeks, here in the last two weeks, and last, you know, he seems very pleased with the last couple of weeks and how things have gone offensively and just kind of speaks to the disconnect that must have been in place between him and Mike Yersich and perhaps the rest of the staff and perhaps even many of the players by the time Yersich was shown the exit door. But here they are two games later, and I'm looking through this stat sheet and I'm like, is this really the Penn State Nittany Lions team that we've watched all year? You've got five different guys 
produce plays of 20 plus yards and and you got it in the ground Trey Potts goes for 28 Nick Singleton has a 24 yard run uh Kate Allen was a 50 yard run and then he goes for 40 again later you've got Theo Johnson with a 22 yard catch you got Nick Singleton with a 53 yard catch Omari Evans oh hello there 60 <laughs> yard bomb down to the one yard line that results in a touchdown and then Keandre Lambert Smith although it was his only reception it was a 22 yard pickup and you string all this stuff together, and, and I want to get to the guy who had a multiple big gains, along with Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. 15 carries for 137 yards. That's 9.1 yards average. Remember the last four weeks of sample size where we really stressed about how he has been kind of that beacon of consistency in an offense that had really gone awry, averaging 5.2 yards per carry in the last month, jumped up to 9.1 today, and he adds uh, another three catches for 17 yards, including a touchdown as a receiver. So Katron Allen has, in my opinion, been this team's offensive MVP. I guess you could explore what Olu Fashionu has done, especially in protecting uh, Drew Aller in that pocket. But when you look at, at the playmakers and the skill position and week by week, who are you counting on? Katron Allen's been that guy. And, you know, he still hasn't had a, a night where he's got to go 28, 30 touches. This wasn't that opportunity. I still wonder what that might look like. Maybe we'll see it down the road for him. Uh, but this is exactly when you kind of closed your eyes in August and said, how is Penn State's offense going to operate? These were the two at the forefront. And really, Katron Allen's been the man at the forefront with Nick Singleton trying to play catch up. And today he did. And we saw what that looked like. Yeah, I, I think watching Katron Allen run today was – really really fun i think that if you were someone where you weren't familiar with katron allen before tonight black friday national national tv game i'm sure there were um you know some some more neutral uh, observers tuning in uh, i i gotta think that people seeing penn state for the first time were probably like whoa like who is this kid <laughs> number 13. You know, the way that he runs how he finishes his runs you know, downfield trying to stiff arm guys running through contact it's just really really impressive to see. Um, I think that today he also showed um, a little bit of speed. Um, it seemed like he was really able to get through the hole quickly and into the second level. Um, I, I was just really impressed with him. And then, you know, a really nice play call on the touchdown catch. Dante Cephas uh, took out two different Spartans uh, with his rub to really make that an easy throw for Drew Aller. Um, and I, Catron Allen, that's an area where I think that he showed it a little bit more last year in the passing game than he did this year, I think. But that's something that he can do pretty well. And uh, you know, he was wide open enough there that it, it wasn't too hard on him. But I, I just think that when you can put Katron Allen and Nick Singleton together, it's just such a, a dangerous combination. And there's not really much like it um, elsewhere in the country. So uh, I think that for Katron, it was a similar thing uh, as with uh, Singleton, where I think he was at 97 yards uh, and they put him back out there for, for another drive. And he promptly okay rips, <laughs> yeah, promptly rips off 40. And then it was funny with Allen and Singleton, like after the, after those runs, they just went right to the sideline. Like they knew everyone knew kind of what, what the goal was, what the end goal was there. Um, and, and they made that happen. So I, I just think that Katron Allen is a really, really fun running back to watch. I think that, He's really, really helped this Penn State offense this year. You can quibble about if there were times when things weren't working, if they should have gone to him more um, and, and let him actually try to carry the load. But I think that it's another solid season and it, it sets him up nicely for, for whatever's next and you know for his, his development and his career. I saw Jay Wan Sider a bit after midnight tweeted out, loading up this happy plane. And he must be a happy man right now because you know he views himself – uh, in some way, shape, and form as a father figure for those two since they got to campus. And he has seen their highs. He has seen some serious lows over the course of this season as well. And now to see the regular season finish this way as he's the co-OC and helping create that game plan, there's a lot of pride involved there. And Ty Howell as well with the way his tight ends have performed for the most part in this matchup. Um, I, I want to dive into those running back stats real quick because they are pretty remarkable. You had no... 100 yard rusher in any of the preceding eight Big Ten matchups for Penn State uh, before this one. Then you had two in a single night here on Black Friday. Tonight, Singleton, Allen combined for 340, 340 total yards on 38 touches. That's an average of 8.9 per touch, whether it's as a receiver or a rusher. Before that, in all the games leading up to the season, 11 prior, 
the highest total for them combined was 175. And that came on 40 touches against Indiana. That's an average of about 4.4. So you're doubling the average. You're essentially doubling that yardage total from your previous high. I cannot, I mean, we cannot overstate how much the ceiling was blown up and lifted and 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 just the what this does for not just Penn State's confidence level, but whoever the hell they get to play in this bowl game, whether it's Alabama or Tulane or whoever, there all of a sudden is a lot more complex uh, of, a, of, a, of a dive into this offense as you prep for that matchup. Yeah, it's it's something where those are two guys that you really needed to show up this year to have success. And, um, you know, you can quibble about if they showed up when they really needed them to or if they were even really given an opportunity to uh, in those Ohio State and Michigan games. But I just think that this Penn State offense, when it has a good running game, uh, you can just see that Drew Aller looks a lot more comfortable back there. He's able to do more. Um, and that you can just really, really just run through teams because you can, Katron Allen can grind it out. Nick, Sing Nick Singleton can be a punishing runner too, but then you get those explosive plays out of them. Uh, and it's just another, another, you know, really nice dimension to have. Before we get on to the running backs, and you know it was a special night for the running backs when it takes us this long to get to Drew Aller when, when he put up his most passing yards since the season opener. But Singleton, after this game, very emphatically stating that he plans to be around in 2024. He's committed to the program, the coaching staff. He mentioned James Franklin. He mentioned Jaywan Sider. And this is probably the guy. I know there's there has been some concern about Drew Aller because when you lose the, the, the quarterback's coach in the OC that recruited him, that's just a natural concern and a bit of a red flag for the situation. We'll talk about Drew in a moment. But with Nick Singleton, because of the lack of productivity, because of all the opportunity that he's had from you know NIL standpoints and because of his former status as Gatorade Player of the Year and Big Ten Freshman of the Year, you just wonder, even with that history here in Pennsylvania, with his history in Penn State, would a change of scenery be in play here and for him to come out here on black friday you know we're, we're, we're not even uh, what 10 days away from the transfer portal opening we're still five six weeks away from this team really finishing out the season and for us to know at least on the record publicly because if it changes it's going to be a, a tough backtrack and it's going to look a little different but nick singleton right now very much committed to being a member of this 2024 roster and that's a very big deal if he's going to work his way back into form and build off of what we saw here. And I know James Franklin probably doesn't like that work his way back to form comment because he thinks he's the better running back. But in terms of being a momentum pusher, a momentum driver, a guy who can change the game for you, that's who he was today. And that's who he was last season. And as much as a well-balanced running back as he was, he wasn't changing games this year until tonight. Yeah, I, I think that that's what you really wanted to see from him when you talk about five-star recruit, uh, someone who you would theoretically be able to even the playing field against a Michigan and an Ohio State. Um, you know, th th this is the running back that um, you know, we were expecting to see all year long. And you, know, you can say too little, too late, you know, something along those lines. But I think just for Nick Singleton's overall trajectory to get to this, you know, to have this kind of game to close on this note, I think that's really big for him. Uh, I think that there is something to be said about having a springboard late in the season to carry in the next year. It's all about confidence. And I, I think that this is the type of game that you come out of it and that confidence is back and you're ready to go. Let's talk about Drew Aller because, <laughs> you know, we're looking for confidence there. Been a rough few weeks. He loses his offensive coordinator. He loses a couple of games that they, they struggled to get the pass game going tonight uh, in an NFL stadium with a lot of people watching that may not have a good picture of who Drew Aller is just yet. 17 of 26 passing. That's a 65% completion rate, 292 yards, two touchdowns. James Franklin felt he maybe missed a few throws while on the move that could have stacked those stats a bit more. But again, those are the most passing yards for Drew Aller since week one against West Virginia when he was up at the 325. And just generally speaking, you can talk about the ability to have a, a balanced ground attack, and he was pretty well protected. There were some misses on the interior uh, end of the offensive line that led to a couple hits on Aller. But overall, I thought the protection was held up well today beyond that. And he comes out of this into bowl prep feeling, you'd imagine, much better about himself than he has in about the past month. Definitely. I I, I think that this was, this was another one of those games when entering the year we talked about Drew Aller, the former five-star, the top quarterback recruit in the nation, 
the guy who can elevate your program. Um, I think that this is what we were expecting to see a lot more this year than we did. I think some of that was what they were asking him to do. Some of that was the scheme and the game plans. Um, but I, I think that today they really put it into a part where he could cut it loose at different times. And um, early on, he was a, a little shaky, I thought, with missing some of those throws. He had the one in the back of the end zone to either Theo Johnson or Tyler Warren where he was rolling to his right. The tight end flashed open really early. Um, and then you know, by the time he threw it, it was you know over in the corner, just a tough throw, not enough space uh, to, to make something happen. But I, I thought that he settled in nicely. Um, you know, he did take a couple hits as uh, on sacks and things like that, but he looked very composed, very in control. Um, and it's and also, it seemed like he was just having fun out there. Uh, there was a one point in the second half when they, the NBC cameras showed the, the sideline and it's uh, Aller, Bo Perbula, Jackson Smolik, Danny O'Brien, um, and, and they're all laughing and smiling, which isn't something that we, we've seen this year. Even in the wins, uh, it, it didn't feel like that there was that sort of atmosphere. Um, and I asked Bo Perbula about it after the game, and um, Bo said that like they just have fun. They like being around each other. Um, he said Danny O'Brien is just such a positive presence that it, it makes it easy um, to have fun and, and, and be smiling like that during a game. So I thought that that was something a little bit different to see from Drew Aller um, in terms of intangible things. But then on the field, I mean, we saw him throw it downfield, 60 yards to Omari Evans, a beautiful throw, one of those things where we've barely seen that this year. And so when you see it, you're kind of like, what? Because I you just like, feel the, the steam getting released, like, you know, from the boiling pot of water, a 60 yard bomb from Drew Aller to Omari Evans. It's just like, wow, the steam is erupting after so much frustration. Yeah. And it was the type of thing where when they lined up for that play, you know, Aller was under center, which is something that you don't see too, too often. Um, and then in my head, I was kind of like, I was like, oh, like play action. That might be, that might be something here. And that's what they went to. And I think that it, it's kind of like the, you don't want to d- simplify things too much in terms of the, just chuck it deep and see what happens. But I think that having something as simple as that play action, see what happens, see what that does to the defense especially on a day when you're running it really well and then get your guy with four, three speed over the top. And Penn state did that. We hadn't seen that all year and it really, really delivered. Um, So I I think that that is one of those things that really gives you confidence moving forward uh, because you can talk about the arm strength all you want. You know, the guys can tell us about what it's like in practice all they want, but we're not there and that doesn't count. You want to see it when it counts. And we finally did that today. Yeah. I want to pick up uh, with Omari Evans in a few minutes, but, but with, with Drew Aller, uh, not only does he, he deliver this kind of a moment, but he delivers a very big statement after this game, uh, not just for these next few weeks, but Penn state's going to go fishing in the transfer portal. They're still, still trying to recruit. It helps when you have the quarterback situation figured out and Drew Aller, Went on the record, just like Nick Singleton, and saying that he has no intention of exploring other options for his junior season of college football and that Penn State's going to be his home in 2024. And James Franklin told us uh, a couple weeks ago, no, Drew Aller is not going to be in the room with him interviewing potential offensive coordinator candidates, which he's going to be working on Zoom this weekend, do, working through some of that. Um, but Drew Aller is going to be engaged in that kind of a process. And so is the entire quarterback room. And he's going to find offensive coordinator that he believes is going to be well suited to put them up for success. So Drew Aller is heavily on his mind, as you'd imagine right now, as he works his way through this process. And now that Drew Aller is officially on board, in case anyone was wondering, and again, it's fair to wonder right now when you talk about a former five-star quarterback who's not from the home state and you've got the transfer portal and people throw around crazy NIL numbers to quarterbacks and for him to say, hey, Penn State's home, that's huge, man. Uh, it was kind of it was kind of funny where you can tell that this has never even been a question for Aller, that's something, because I think the first time he got asked the question, he kind of like didn't really understand it and, and was just he hasn't was, been on our message board then yeah he, he was just kind of like he was like oh no like i haven't thought about this at all he's like i'm in this year like he was kind of like why why would i think about that um and then audrey snyder from the athletic circled back with him to be like 
kind of spell it out and explain it. And then he was just like, Drew was just like, oh, yeah, no, like, I'm here. Like, this is it. Um, and, you know, I think some people might wonder oh, why you're asking the quarterback that in the aftermath of a game like this. But, you know, Mike Yersich recruited him. Mike Yersich was on him early when he was still a three star. Um, he was the quarterback's coach. We had not spiked up at the top. We had not spoken with Drew yes. since Mike Yurcic was fired. That's that's been important context. We didn't get him after the Rutgers game. Remember, he was he was banged up. So this is our first time speaking to him since that went down. Yeah. So we we had a lot of ground to cover between Yurcic today's game, his injury. Uh, he also said that there was like there's no doubt that he was going to play today uh, in his mind, and he looked healthy <laughs> um, from what whatever happened to him, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it is it is a thing where you do wonder, especially when some of these players get very attached to certain position coaches um, that bring them in. We see this happen all the time um, in terms of movement. But I, I do think that when you talk about what James Franklin has done in building his program is that he tries to minimize that in terms of when a kid commits, he's committing not to Mike Yersich. He's committing to the program. He's committing to Penn State and James Franklin. Um, and that's kind of what Drew Aller said, is that he's committed to James Franklin and, and he's committed to Penn State. Um, so I, I think that it, it is something in, in this era with how easy it is for player movement um, and all the factors that and things that factor into player movement now. I mean, you do have to you know, kind of cover your bases, uh, talk to these guys about it when you get the chance. And so um, I, I thought that that was... It's something that is is nice to have on the record, uh, and it's nice that uh, James Franklin can tell wide receivers in, in the transfer portal that, hey, look, he's staying. Uh, and you, you never know who else that might attract in terms of defensive players and um, type and players who just want to be around someone like Drew Aller. So we'll, we'll see how it all plays out, but um, it, it was something that you know needed to be asked tonight, and um, we have a little, we've got some, some more clarity on the future, even if it wasn't necessarily that foggy to begin with. Daniel, do you think it's fair to qualify November 24th, 2023 as a, a real culture win for James Franklin, not just finishing with an emphatic victory when we we're all wondering where the motivation would look like and how this team would show up offensively and to do what they did on the field. And then to hear what we heard afterwards with Nick Singleton and Drew Aller affirming their plans for 2024. I mean, this feels like a as big of a win of a moment here on Thanksgiving weekend that a two-loss team could pick up for James Franklin. Yeah, I think these past two weeks have been really, really big on the culture, big for the culture and because of the culture. Um, you know, we talked about Theo Johnson last week after the game, uh, addressing the team and addressing James Franklin, um, kind of catching him by surprise a little bit. Um, I think that that kind of showed that this team has James Franklin's back. Um, you know, they, they were reading social media after the Michigan game, they were hearing it on the field you know, they knew what people were saying. Um, and then I think today to be able to close out a game like this, uh, you know, like I think today was a little bit of a bring your own, bring your own juice game. Uh, it's, you know, we went over the circumstances and it's kind of like, you know, what are you still playing for at this point? I know that we talked about at, at this time last year, it was an ascending team. Yeah. Um, and there's a case that this year's team was a plateauing team um, because of the expectations and the record and being unable to build on it. Um, so I, I maybe think now I mean, it doesn't feel maybe we were, it's Michigan State. They've been they, and, they, and they maybe they ran out of gas here. But now you've got a bit of a springboard moment where, look, it's Rutgers, it's Michigan State, but maybe it's a, a top 10 opponent. And, yeah. and maybe you can reclaim that ascension status, especially when you're not bleeding talent. And it doesn't sound like they're going to be bleeding talent. In fact, it sounds like they're probably in position to be adding talent and retaining talent. We'll see what the NFL draft decisions shake out. But uh, that's kind of where my mind is at with it. Yeah, I, I think Penn State is kind of a going into bowl season. They're going to be a little bit of a house money team. Um, Opt-outs obviously will could change the outlook on that. But I think even if – you know, they're not at they're not today's team isn't the one that plays in the bowl game. I think that because of kind of their ups and downs this year, um, that they're at the point where they can just kind of go in and be like, all right, like, let's let it rip. You know, we're, we're getting an offensive coordinator. Like we need a new offensive coordinator. Uh, we're losing all these guys on our defense. Um, let's just kind of roll the ball out there and 
and see what happens. Um, and I think that that, that can kind of help you ascend. I mean, I do think that having to hire a new offensive coordinator, I like that is still a, a little bit of a reset um, in terms of that ascension, because you are going to go into next year with some questions about that. Um, you know, what does this look like? How is this working? But, you know, I do think that depending on how bowl season shakes out, you know, getting these extra practices in, um, really ramping things up. Um, I, I do think that you can kind of, you know, next year, uh, you know, preseason ranking time, you see Penn State, you know, in that eight, nine, 10 range where you're kind of like, all right, they're, they're going to be in the mix for the expanded playoff, win a couple games and you're floating around the top five. They have been the team that, that is one of the primary examples of if there was a 12 team playoff, how, you know, who would it have affected most? And Penn State's the team that's always brought up and they look like they're going to be, you know, barring some changes here uh, in the college football playoff rankings coming out of the weekend and probably in that top 12 again. Um, and James Franklin uh, knows that that's, you know, 10 and 2 could look a lot different moving forward when that playoff expands. I wanted to, to, to as we address so many stats here. I wanted to just note two stats here, uh, uh, sacks, sacks by and sacks against on the season. Penn State was seven tonight, got the 48 sacks through 12 games. No one in the Big Ten is within 15 right now of that going into their final regular season game. So I think they're safe as the Big Ten's leader in sack this year. Another credit to, to Manny Diaz, another feather in his cap on the season. And then in terms of sacks allowed now that they finished their season, 15 sacks allowed in, in 12 games uh, with the first year starting quarterback. Um, that is the third best mark in the conference. I do want to note that Rutgers is number one with 12. They haven't had their quarterback drop back much over the course <laughs> of the season. And and I, and I also want to note this, that 2021 season, Mike Yersich's first year as offensive coordinator, uh, a year when this team just couldn't really find it, its ability to run the ball. Uh, they surrendered 34 sacks that season. So less than half of that total here. Uh, through 12 matchups in 2023. I know some people wanted to see bigger ground game numbers. They want to say, I, I think you can very well see whether it's the depth that has been built, the recruits that have been bought in, and here the tangible evidence that Phil Troutwine in year four, we're talking about a different situation on the offensive front. So I just wanted to make note of those two big numbers. You mentioned Theo Johnson. Let, let's work our way to the finish line here, Daniel. I know you've got to get a little bit of sleep before you got to wake up for your flight out of Detroit. But Theo Johnson had another big game. He's had a fantastic sec second half. All six of his touchdowns on the season have come after that bye week. So it tells you a little bit about what it's looked like for him here in the last seven matchups. It's four catches, 59 yards, uh, leading the team in receptions. He had that 22 yard grab as well and a touchdown. He's just from, you know, he's not the Detroit kid like the King Twins and Jalen Reed, but he's just across the river in, in Windsor, Ontario. So I know you had a chance to, to talk with him. You, you wrote about some of the, the, the opportunity for these Detroit homecomings. Kobe King played well. Kaylin King was out there. You had Jalen Reed coming up with an interception. Uh, and then, of course, as I mentioned, Theo uh, was one of the top performers on offense. What, what did you make of their chance? Because in terms of bring your own juice, these guys didn't need to find it. They had it all right there waiting for them back home. Yeah, Jalen Reed said that he had 33 people there as wow. part of his party. Uh, Jalen said that Theo Johnson had 31. Uh, <laughs> Jalen Reed was like, yeah, I think we took all the tickets <laughs> for, <laughs> for for the team this weekend. But uh, I, I think that it, it meant a lot for for both of those guys. Um, Theo Johnson got asked about his, his touchdown um, after he scored it. He he gestured to the tattoo that's on his arm, and he has the Detroit skyline tattooed there. And he was kind of explaining how people would, you know, when he got it, people were like, "Well, you're not from Detroit. Like, why why do you have that?" And he said that it's you know he's from across the river. So that's the skyline that he looked at every day growing up. And that's that's what he saw. And that's kind of home to him, um, which I thought was a, a pretty cool explanation for that. And it just I think it, it meant a lot to him. I think that he's a guy that over the course of this year, we've really learned how much all of this means to him, um, even beyond the, the emotion that we saw um, after the Michigan game. But just that he was out there uh, after a lot of games available to us. Uh, he talked after Ohio State too. Um, he was, you know, pretty honest. Never really flinched uh, at any questions or anything like that. So I think to kind of have him get rewarded uh, to come back here. He talked about how he went to one Lions game growing up, and he sort of envisioned himself at Ford Field, uh, being able to to play at this level. And so to be there today, I think really did 
uh, mean a lot to him. So I think that it was, uh, it was kind of a, a nice little wrinkle um, in terms of storylines around the game and, and guys getting to go home. Um, Cause a lot of these, a lot of these colleges, like there's not a lot of guys from Ann Arbor. There's not a lot of guys from East Lansing that will end up at, at a Penn state. So um, it was cool. I, I think that, you know, both of the, all four of those guys really, really showcase what they can do. Um, and I think that you know, having Theo Johnson score a touchdown, Jalen Reed getting an interception, um, it's, it's pretty storybook stuff when, when, when you really get down to it. And Kobe King told us he was 0-2 at Ford Field going back to his youth football days in Detroit. So he was excited to pick up his first victory. Um, one name that we mentioned in passing, but really interesting to me about how he handles the upcoming month and the bowl game. And then what happens after that? Because I know maybe he's been cast to the wayside by a lot of fans, and we haven't mentioned him much. But Omari Evans resurfaced, and two catches, one catch, uh, one catch this week, one catch last week. But they were both big catches. You know, two catches for 85 yards in the previous portion of this season, which is a lot of football. He had two catches for nine yards. So look, four catches on the season uh, is not going to wow you. But what he has done lately recency bias i'm buying a little more stock in amari evans and he seems to be the primary example when james franklin goes on the public record here the last couple of weeks and saying we need to accentuate the positives of our of our athletes rather than trying to force them to be everything amari evans is like the example to me and i'm really curious to see what he can accomplish in the next few weeks on the practice field definitely uh i talked to him after after the game tonight for a while I'm going to write about that online 24 uh, seven in the coming days. But um, you know, he talked about that things being simple and you know, playing to your strengths. Like he, he knows the speed that he has, he knows what it can bring to an offense. Um, and so that he, he feels like when he's out there on the field that he can really be an asset. Um, you know, he kind of didn't have too much to say about what this year was like for him. Um, I think that he kind of played that like a little, a little close to the vest, but I think he did say it was, it was pretty rewarding, um, to have the opportunity, um, to be put in that role and, and to succeed. Um, he was also wide open for a touchdown on, on the play where, uh, Aller hit Keandre Lambert Smith for 22 yards uh, on a drive. And, uh, Omari said that, you know, he went up to Drew afterwards <laughs> and, and Drew told him that he was just a little late to him in the progression. Um, but I think that you think about the blue white game, uh, you know, seven months ago or however long it was. And we thought Omari Evans was going to be wide receiver three. Um, and it hasn't really worked out like that. Um, we've seen his, uh, snap counts go up a lot. We started seeing him in the first halves of some games. Um, so, you know, for someone you, you kind of hope that, all right, maybe he's putting it together in practice. Maybe they're getting to a point where, they 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 feel comfortable putting him out there. They trust him, um, and, and he can put himself in a position where, through bowl practice uh, and beyond, he can work his way into being trusted um, and, and work his way into being someone that they can rely on. Because and we saw it last year. Whenever uh, you know, I think he caught he was a, a favorite target for Drew Aller. You know, when Aller would come in in, in the fourth quarter of games last year. So I, I think that Omari Evans is someone that uh, has kind of been like looming there's been like the specter of omari evans this whole season because we know that we know we knew the production problems at wide receiver we know what his skill set is we saw him in the blue white game um and just the the puzzle pieces never quite fit together um for it so i I think that you look at tonight um and i think he's the type of player where this performance could be a springboard thing you do it in the game you put it on tape you almost get that touchdown uh, and you can really really move forward with it We've talked so much about how how big of a factor in that receiver room the 2022 receivers class is. Five guys uh, from that class, and one of them only one, Vern Redshirt last year. It was Omari Evans, and so to see him be such a background component of the process this year has been a bit jarring. And then it felt like maybe Caden Saunders was taking the the forefront as the man to know in that five player group, and he's been a bit quiet here on the offensive th- side of things in the last couple matchups of the regular season. So. You know, you got Christian Driver, Tyler Johnson, and 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 then Anthony Ivy doing their business on the practice field for the most part. I think it's a very tall task to, to think you're going to get all five of those guys back in this room next spring. But you need some building blocks. It can't all just be let's go grab a bunch of college veterans because you know you saw what happens. It's not a guaranteed plug and play and produce situation here. 
Um, but I, I think it's it's a really good sign on, on a night where there were a lot of, of, of guys seemingly rounding the corner towards a, a better better part of the of the season compared to where they were. Mari Evans is on that list. And just taking inventory real quick, what's going on this week? Because Penn State's kind of in flux. They're, they're waiting to find out who their bowl matchup is. They will not know that until December 3rd after all the conference championships are played. Uh, but James Franklin talked about spending a lot of time on Zoom Saturday and Sunday this weekend uh, with offensive coordinator prospects. Uh, you know, don't know to what extent. Maybe this is just a process for him to, to weed his way through, kind of do some speed dating. Um, but I don't know. You know he, he made it seem like there's a, a, a significant list of, of potential candidates that he'll be working his way through. And then recruiting, they're going to uh, get together, come up with a formula where they want to prioritize and traveling to this upcoming week. Going to be watching a lot of film, sounds like, coming off of this high school season to see where they want to venture out to. And then ultimately, uh, meetings with players. And this is a really interesting one because that transfer portal opens up just about the same time you're going to find out who your opponent is for the bowl game. So they got a few days lined up here where position coaches are going to take the brunt of that. But James Franklin will have several one-on-one -on -one meetings with players. And this is where you really have to have some of those tougher conversations because you're doing a bit of an autopsy with these guys on how things have gone. You've seen an offensive coordinator change, so there's going to be more of a, a, a more dynamics in play with some of those offensive players and how things went. And then you're going to really have to be honest from a from a coach perspective and a player perspective. Is this relationship going to extend beyond 2023? And when you've got 85 guys on scholarship and you want to go grab more of the transfer portal and you're not sure who's leaving in the NFL draft, you got some things to figure out. You got some things to talk through. So a lot of those things won't be super reportable along the way, but you know, we'll keep our, our, our ear uh, to things. And, and as we get uh, some information, you'll find it at lines247.com. Um, read between the lines season is what we're going to be entering now. Uh, Daniel, anything else to add before we say goodnight and wrap up shop here on our final postgame podcast of the regular season? No, I mean, you know, 13 weeks ago uh, around this time or plus plus a day, uh, we were breaking <laughs> down that West Virginia game and figuring out what was next. And now I'm I'm 59 floors above Detroit right now and Penn State's 10 and two uh, a dominant victory. I mean, it did go by really fast, uh, I think, you know, in the middle, even though it felt like a bit of a slog at times um, with kind of the, the grind of the season. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to see what happens next and to cover, cover the rest of it because it's, it's going to be busy. I mean, December is, is now the way the calendar is such a busy month um, yes. for, for these programs. And so, you know, I'll take my, you know, I'll take my couple days sleep in next week and relax, but then we find out that bowl matchup transfer portal opens signing days right after that yeah. we're back in the grind yeah there's already a lot cooking in the transfer portal with, with some things uh, that we got reported at lines 247com and and just general recruiting intensity is going to be heating up with the signing day so take advantage of our 75 percent offer deal it applies to black friday but it's also going through cyber monday so you got the whole weekend and into monday uh, to take, make a jump at that 75% off an annual VIP subscription to become a Penn State insider with us all the way through basketball, football, prospect camps, signing day, transfer portal, recruiting, and more. Um, Daniel, appreciate it. It's been fun. Uh, we haven't had one of these late ones in a little while, so we crossed that off our list. We'll find out what we got for a bowl game. We'll be back for a post-game podcast. We are going to be condensing. It's been a fun ride going with four episodes per week, but we're not going to have quite as much to bring your way. Um, so we're going to go to two weeks. Maybe we'll have some breaking news podcasts to come with you if there's some big news to report. But expect us back next on Tuesday. We'll give Daniel some time. He's going to have a delayed Thanksgiving. We'll let the Brennans get home to State College. And we'll regroup on Tuesday with our thoughts on this matchup and what Penn State's facing in the postseason. We'll get back to our two-episode uh, two per week schedule. And, of course, when we get out to our bowl destination, we'll ramp things up a little bit with, with some extra episodes. Daniel, it's been fun uh, riding shotgun with you along the way here. And, and, we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll touch base again on Tuesday. In the meantime, get some sleep, fly safely, and appreciate all your efforts, man. Thanks, Tyler. All right. On behalf of Daniel, I'm Tyler Downhue. This has been the Lions 24-7 Podcast. We'll talk to you real soon.